Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin. Ve salatu ve selamu ala Seyyidina Muhammedin ve Alisa ve Yusselam. Ne tetelim ve ta'lim. Ve tezekir ve tezkir ve nefu l-intifa'a ve l-ifade ve l-istifade. Ve l-hasra temessuk bi kitab ila işin Resulihi sallallahu aleyhi ve sellem. Ve dua'i lil-huda ve dilada aril khayr ibtiqa ve cillahi ve merdati ve kurbi thwabi subhanahu wa ta'ala subhanaka la ilmi la illa ma illemtena. إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله لما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله you know سبحان الله we are definitely on the cusp of um, some great days uh, and there's no doubt that the days that approach us now are the most righteous days throughout the whole year you know by consensus of the ulama that um, the days the first ten days of the Hijjah are the greatest days of the Islamic calendar, save that the greatest nights are the last 10 of Ramadan. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no doubt um, honors these days. He takes an oath, وَالْفَجْرُ وَلَيَالٍ عَشِرُ By Fajr and by these 10 nights, by extension meaning these days, which the ulama in the majority hold that Allah is taking an oath by what the 10 days of, of the Hijjah. Um, first and foremost, who's taking an oath? Right? Your Lord, Jalla fil Ula, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is swearing by these days. In that we what? We don't even see Allah swear by the days of Ramadan. But he is swearing, taking an oath in pre-eternal, sempaternal revelation by these blessed days. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors these days. Therefore, mashallah, tabarakallah, no doubt, it's a manifestation of the goodness that he wills for each and every single one of you. MashaAllah is here today, and likewise our dear brothers and sisters who are online, and that you come here, why? Likewise to honor these days. You could be elsewhere, right? We could be elsewhere right now, but we come here, why? To honor days that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors. By Him taking an oath, wal-fajr, wal-ayalin, ashr. So He's taking an oath by these great days. So there's no doubt that subhanAllah, when we commence these gatherings, we always say alhamdulillah, no doubt, alhamdulillah la kulli hal. Or praises Allah for every single state that we find ourselves in. But more so now we're on the cusp of days that he himself swears by. And by honoring these, these lessons, by honoring these days, we are honoring him, subhanahu, subhanahu wa ta'ala. On the cusp of the days of what? Of hajj. You know, hajj and I, you know, many a time we look at what the words mean. You know, our teachers remind us that hajj, in language, what does hajj mean? Hajj literally means to intend or seek something out. That if I said in the Arabic language, Hajjaj to Fulanan, I sought out, I intended Fulan. And so Hajj is what? Seeking out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dedicating yourselves for the seeking out of the pleasure and the ridwan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, they say that the ulama, when they speak about Ramadan, in relation to the men and the women of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they say what? That every day for them is Ramadan. Think about it, because these are days that we need to be reminded of. When we remind one another, it profits who? It profits the believers. Now, Ramadan we have maybe a greater connection to by virtue of what? By virtue of us fasting. So we feel something in relation to those days. But more so in relation to the days of Hajj, maybe the community doesn't feel as connected by virtue of us not being on the pilgrimage or not being in those sacred spaces. But we're going to see here from the, the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, many, op- any, uh, options, um, many opportunities to connect to that reality, to be with the people on the plain of Arafah on those days. But Ramadan, the ulama say what? They say that every day for the men and women of Allah is Ramadan. And Eid is what? Eid is the day that they meet their Lord. That's their Eid. Right? Likewise, Hajj. What do we say? Just what, did it, what does it mean? To intend, to seek out who? To seek out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so for the men and women of Allah, we need reminders. They are the reminders. For them, every single day is Hajj. Why? Because every single day they're seeking out Allah subhanahu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, the, con- the concept of tawaf, to circumambulate, circuit the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, i.e. everything revolves around this. Men and women of Allah, their whole existences revolve around Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's an internal tawaf. Sa'i, what does sa'i mean? Oh, it means to go between Safa and Marwa. Sa'i literally means to exert and hasten to do something. 
ليس للإنسان إلا ما سعى. Allah says in the Quran, mankind only has that which he strives towards. So the sa'i, the internal sa'i, the men and women of Allah, it's always hajj for them. Because they are always in a state of what striving to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we are people who are weak, we need reminders. Right? And there's a mutual reminding. And like I said, Allah bless those that are here online and those that are here today. Because we come here seeking out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on our blessed day, on our Jumu'ah. This is our quote-unquote happy, this is our Eid. You know, every week we have an Eid. And it's today. And we come here by the blessings of Allah in sacred space. Why? Because we're here seeking sacred knowledge to speak about the honoring days that he subhanahu wa ta'ala honors, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam honored. Right? Now, why are these days, uh, from one aspect, why are they classed as the greatest days of the, of the, of the Islamic calendar? Ibn Hajar, uh, rahmatullah alayhi, he said that if we look we can do all, meaning al Islam al Khams, right? Islam is predicated, mabni, its foundational understanding is predicated upon five realities the Shahada, Tahli, La ilaha illallah, right? What is some of the atqar that we should be saying in these 10 days? Tahleel, the Prophet says, make these days of Tahleel, right? So, first pillar, second pillar, Salat. No doubt we have to pray. Now, prayer in these days is much more rewarding than prayer outside of these days. Say that again, in these days, prayer exists. Okay, zakat, people will dedicate paying their zakat, likewise in this month, by virtue of the reward being what? Multiplied over and over again. Fasting, it's sunnah to fast every single day in these 10 days, but if not specifically, on the day of Arafah. But again, what's the last pillar of Islam? Hajj, and you can only do this when? in these 10 days. So these 10 days are superior to any of the days outside of them by virtue of the whole entirety of the principles, the foundation of Islam resides within these 10 days. So if Allah exalts these days, likewise we should what? Exalt these days. And these days should be recognized from one aspect as what? Days of humility, right? That we are coming and knocking on the door of who? The King of Kings. That we come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a level of an inward ihram. Okay, ihram has a meaning. What does ihram mean? Because people, people when they say, when they speak about ihram, what do, they, what do they ordinarily go to? People of Luton. Luton Sharif. What do, when we speak about ihram, what do people ordinarily conclude by ihram? It's not a trick question again. Future of Islam here. What? What? It's not. What do we say when we think about haram? We think about what? That's that's that that's haram. Something which haram. You know, when you go on on uh, Hajj and you go into a state of a haram, you think about wearing what? For men, it's the clothing, isn't it? The haram of the izar and the rida, the outward cloak, the upper cloak, and then the lower lower cloak. All right. That's just a condition of the ihram. Ihram is to put yourself into a sacred state, which means what? That we can put ourselves into a sacred state, right? That's the point. And by putting ourselves into a sacred state, you're coming to Bayt al-Haram, right? The inviolable house. And you come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with humility, with humbleness. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the, in the books of Sirah, when he came in as quote-unquote, you know, for loss of a better word, you know, because the Fath of Mecca, they translate as the conquest, but it's beyond that because Allah is Al-Fatih, the one who opens. And you see that the conduit by which he opens up Mecca, Al-Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, on a day where he could have taken retribution for all of the, you know, the decade plus of the torture against him. How does Sayyid Al-Khalq, the greatest being, to traverse this earth, how does he approach the Kaaba? He approaches it what? With his head lower to the extent it's almost touching what? The saddle of his riding beast. Okay, they say when the Prophet ﷺ performed the Hajj, that was, it was on a, a worn out saddle under which was a rug, which la tusawi arba darahim. It did not, it wasn't even equal to paying four silver coins. And he said on the conclusion of the Hajj, Allahumma. Hajjatan la riyan wa la sum'ata fihi. That, oh Allah, I pray that this was a hajj, that there's no riya, there's no showing off, no sum'a. I'm not seeking the, the, 
the validation of men in this regards, right? That was his Hajj, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, and his whole existence, because we've spoken about this in our lessons that the faqr, the poverty of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, was what faqr al ikhtiyar. It was the poverty of his own volition, of his own choice, right? Had he so wished, he was given the opportunity to take the khazaina dunya wal akhirah, the treasure troves of this world and and the next. Right? But his faqr, his poverty was that from his own volition. But even more so is accented when? In these days. When he goes to the house of the king of kings. And so ours is to put ourselves into a state. Inshallah, some of you may or may, may not be going to the Hajj. Inshallah, I'll accept what everyone is intending, those who are and those who aren't. But the majority possibly won't be going. Right? But we want to get into that same state. We want to have that same connection. Right? Our teachers tell us what? That there will be people who are making tawaf around the Kaaba that have no portion of the Hajj. Right? And we really have to think about in a time where we occupy an immense commercialization and you know, people will go there and they will take these black mirrors and they will get that perfect picture of the Kaaba, maybe looking off into the distance to feign some type of reflection and the like. You at the house of who? Right? What's our state? Marhaban, take your picture for memory, personal memory at another time. Yeah, but focus on why you're there, who you are visiting, whose door metaphorically or, or uh, metaphysically are we tending to knock on, the door of the king of kings. Well, Sayyid al-Khalq, he enters as someone who experienced poverty for the majority um, of his life. And he comes there on purposely on items which are quote-unquote shabby and then his prayer or his hope is oh Allah hajjatan la ri'a wa la sum'ah inshallah may this be a hajj where there's no type of showing off kaif ya rasulullah <laughs> meaning how how is the prophet sallallahu going to show off he's the qudwa for us for us to embody for us to envelop for us to personify for us to exemplify because if people come there with the, 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 the wrong frame of mind, which is why to quote our teachers by saying what? Certain people, when we make making tawaf around the Kaaba, they have no portion of the Hajj or the Umrah by extension. And certain people whose you know, eyes, the tears, you know, they'll weep and their hearts are connected, have the full reward of the Hajj, yet they were not able to go. Right? We know that, for example, I was speaking to, I was giving a, a course in London a few days ago and I was asking some of the brothers, a, a couple like, how much is the Hajj? La ilaha illallah. Like how, I, I, I didn't know this was the case, and maybe maybe they're um, maybe they got I don't know some type of deluxe package. How much is Hajj now? £10, That's what they, they said ten thousand uh, pounds, and they said that wasn't like the the quote unquote gold package. <laughs> right? Kafava. There's so many people by virtue of that are no no longer able to to go on Hajj. But because of what? Their intention, inshallah, they will get the reward of the full hajj. Right? They have a tashabba bil qawm. They have a resemblance of, of those people, inshallah, which we're going to speak about. So you go there with humility. They say that one of the salihin, he sees someone in the days, in the days of old performing the tawaf and um, the sa'i between Safa and Marwa, and he had slaves. And his slaves were moving people out of the way so that he could perform tawaf and the sa'i. And they say that the same pious individual saw this individual years later in Basra. And he was a beggar. And he said, what happened? And he goes, I went to a place where I should have been humble before God. And now Allah has humbled me. Okay? Because, we, you know, again, the ihram is a state, is it not? Like, Marhaban, we speak about the, the enveloping of the rida, of the outer shawl, upper shawl, and the lower one for, you know, for men. Why is it that you can't wear jewelry? Why is it that you have to wear unstitched clothing? Right? What's it a reminder of? That, you know, prince or pauper, you're all equal before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There shouldn't be a discernment in that regard. You're not allowed to wear jewelry. There are meanings behind this. Because you come to Allah with a level of humility, inshallah, right? Now, if the majority of us are not able, if the majority of us are not able uh, to um, perform the hajj, 
What is the gift or one of the gifts from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in regards? A niya. Right? And this is something again we remind ourselves over and over again. Our teachers say what? Abrazu hadi an niyat. Make those intentions. There's a hadith in, a, uh, by, in, the, um, in the compilation of Abu Ya'la that people will enter paradise only yawm al-qiyam by virtue of what the intentions that they made. You know, again, Ramadan, we tend to think, okay, well, we have what? Uh, um, Rajab and Sha'ban to prepare for Ramadan. Likewise, we have Shawal and Dhul Ka'ada to get ourselves into a state where we're making these intentions. So that when we enter these 10 days, the heart and the soul is prepared and directed towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember, these are days that He takes an oath by. Your Lord, the creator of the heavens and the earth, takes an oath by these days. And we can just, they can just pass us by in a state of what? Ghafla, in a state of heedlessness. It's a, I'll wait till Yom al Arafah, I'll do some Yom al Arafah. You know, who's, again, who can guarantee they're going to see Yom al Arafah? So, but what we can guarantee right now is that we make intentions from today or prior to today so that our hearts and our souls are directed towards Allah subhanahu, subhanahu wa ta'ala. At least have the intention and see what your generous Lord has in store for you. We've mentioned in his class, in the Hadith class, the famous narrative by the great scholar Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Mubarak. And his name may potentially come up a couple of times in, in the lessons today. And he was someone that would spend you know, his time either you know, um, guarding the borders of the Islamic State or he'd spend a year dedicated to worship and a year dedicated to um, teaching and um, studying. And they say that um, he had accumulated or gathered some money to perform the Hajj on a particular year. And so he's passed by a mazbala, um, a, a place where we would discard our rubbish and the like. And he sees um, a woman who's um, looking for something to eat and she picks up um, a dead chicken or a dead bird. And he says, Ya Amatillah, O female servant of God, what are you doing? And he quotes the ayah, Inna maharrama al mayta wa dam wa lahm al khinzir, that Allah has forbidden to eat carrion like dead meat uh, and blood and um, the flesh of, of, of pork and the like. And she says, What? She goes, Utruk al khalq lil khalik. Oh, so and so, leave the creation to the creator. And so he goes, Well, why are you doing what you're doing? And she goes that I'm someone who's widowed and I have no money and I have four daughters. And so you as the great Abdullah ibn Mubarak know that in these circumstances, these things are what? Made permissible for certain people. So he starts to weep. And he's, the money that he had gathered for the Hajj, he goes, I prefer to give it to you. So he gives her the money for the Hajj. And he goes to the people and he bids them farewell from his locality when they go and perform um, the Hajj. And then they come back. And when the people come back, they say what? Ya uh, Ibn al-Mubarak, Ya yani, subhanAllah, we didn't benefit from your lessons like we benefited from the lessons that you gave in Hajj. And we benefited, we benefited from your worship, but we benefit more so from seeing how assiduously you worshipped on the Hajj. And he's, and he's taghrab. He's like, what are they talking about? And he, didn't, and he kept it a secret. He didn't want to tell them because they were expecting him to go on Hajj because he had saved the money to go on Hajj. But he didn't want to tell them. He didn't want to what? Expose his good deed that he gave that money away to someone who was in dire need. And so he goes to sleep that night and then he sees in a dream what? That there's, there's narrations. One is that the Prophet ﷺ addresses Sayyidina Abdul Mubarak. Wabarak Allahu fiqh. And he goes, may Allah bless you, Abdul Mubarak. Right? Because of your generosity to that woman, Allah has created an angel to adopt your form and to perform 70 hajjis. Each one is tam, 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 completely accepted. Right? You see the power of what? Intention. Whoever endeavors to just resemble a people, inshallah, they will be from amongst them. So at least make those intentions. Right? That if we can't go, because like I said, subhanAllah, Allah bless those that are going now. Um, and every single penny that people have saved and every single penny that they've spent to perform the Hajj and every single penny they spend on the Hajj is rewarded yani, sab'af, yani, 700 ila, ila, ila akhirahi, until Allah wills from His immense generosity. There's no, there's no limit on the generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
but at least make those intentions, right? And if these are sacred days, how are they discerned from other days in the week? Like what do you as, and me as a Muslim, inshallah, and as a believer, by the barakah of the Prophet sallallahu how do we discern these days from? Just as the Prophet said what? Don't make the day that you're fasting like the day that you're not fasting. What does he mean by that? What does the Prophet mean by that? Don't make the day that you're fasting like the day you're not fasting. Increase in worship, in essence, be a different human being. Don't be the same person. No doubt worship, devotional practice, is something which is part and parcel of that understanding. But the way you conduct yourself, the way you talk, right? When you're fasting and someone comes to you aggressively, what do you say to that person? We took the hadith when we prior to Ramadan. <coughs> Come on, future of Islam. Future of Islam, these are things, no, again? again? How many times? There's a clue there. Yeah? In nisa'im, in nisa'im. That when someone comes to you and acts you know, aggressively or belligerently, you say to that person, I'm fasting. Why, is this, why, why did the ulama say you say it twice? Because he or she doesn't understand? No. The first one is to tell him. The second one is to remind yourself. I'm not going to be the same cranky, aggressive person I usually am. <laughs> yeah? I'm going to be a different person, right? Likewise here, in these days, because in these 10 days, you know, acts of worship, we are supposed to fast these 10 days. So likewise, fasting of these 10 days, be a different person. Don't be the same wretched fulan that you are ordinarily. Yeah? Allow people to experience the fragrance of Islam by seeing you in your places of work, in your colleges, uh, at homes, between your families, be a different person. Allow your neighbors to experience a different person. And if they are to ask you, then ex- you know, that's your, your opportunity to explain to them the lofty ethics of our faith. But yes, yeah, so 10 days you're supposed to be doing what? Fasting. Okay. Each day, in, this, uh, in the first, um, when they say the first 10, we're speaking about the 9 because the 9th is Al-Hijjah, the 10th is Eid. Right, the, 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 Each of these days, for you to fast, again, encouragement or incentivize is that every single day is equivalent to fasting a whole year. Right? And we may say what? Oh, look, it's hot. Yeah? Do, again, do I have to fast? Yeah, what, you mean, any, Allah says what? Naru, naru jahannam ashad. Right? They get, like Allah, you know, in the Quran, people, oh, we're not going to go out because it's too hot. We're not going to go out and wage war because it's too hot. The hypocrite said that. Allah responds by saying what? He goes, the fire of, of, of hell is, is beyond hot. Right? Sayyidina Ali, karam Allah, what you say what? Uhibbu thalaf, I love three things. Ikram al-dayf, to ennoble a guest. Was somu be safe. And to fast in the summertime. And think about where they were in the peninsula. Was darb al be safe. And to strike the enemy with the sword. Right? That don't think... Of course, you know, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Someone with like, who's elderly or medicinal problems or something, we're not, there's obvious dispensations for people not fasting. But, you know, let's put some effort into this, right? If I'm struggling, hold my hand. If you're struggling, we hold people up who are struggling. Let's do things collectively. There's a barakah in the jama'ah. We take pass. Okay, let's do this. As a class, let's try and encourage one another. We're going to make sure that all of the nine days of Dhul-Hijjah, we're going to fast. Your Lord is, your, your, your Lord is telling you via Al-Mustafa, وسلم, what? That one day, khalas, a whole year's worth of fasting. Right? Nine days, nine years. And then Yawm Al-Arafah, Tafash al Arafah is what kafara for the year, it expiates, wipes away the sins for the year prior and the year coming. Right? Our teachers say what? It's like putting, you know, imagine you've got like um, a computer and you put all of your, your, your bad deeds into a file and you just click on delete for the whole year. Yeah? Kafara. It's an immense fadl. Days honored by God. So honor those days. Honor those days by fasting. Okay? Particularly Yom al Yom al-Arafah, right? What else should we be doing apart from fasting? Dhikr. When Allah says in the Quran, وَيَذْكُرُونَ إِسْمَ اللَّهِ فِي أَيَامٍ مَعْلُومَاتٍ And they make dhikr, mentioning the name of God on these well-known days. Again, commentary, what are these well-known days? Again, the days of Dhul-Hijjah. 
So again, your Lord is honoring these days. Let's honor these days with dhikr. Close the, 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 the black mirror. Close the TV for those who have a TV or whatever it is we're watching on whatever device we're watching. You know, dedicate days for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At least do it for these nine days, by extension the ten and, and thereafter. Right? Get yourself into this habit. But what is one of the challenges that we find? One of the challenges that we find is what? Is that we think we'll do it on the first of the hijjah but because there's been no what? Training. There's been no inward preparation. Then it becomes difficult. Or as many a Muslim, we're fantastic at doing what? Doing everything for the first day. Listen, remember taraweeh in Ramadan, first week. Or oh, first week, that's optimistic. Yeah? First three days, Allahu Akbar. There's no space. Thereafter, what happens? Me, myself, and, and I. Yeah? No one's left. That's, that's a state. That's a hal that's been reflected about something which resides within you. Yeah? So be people of dhikr. You know, like I said, وَيَذْكُرُونَ إِسْمَ اللَّهِ فِي أَيَامٍ مَعْلُومَاتٍ They make dhikr, Allah is saying this, of His name in these what? In these well-known days, these days being what? The days of the hijjah And the Prophet said what? That these are days we should make what? Abundant, right? What's abundant? Profuse. Tahleel. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah. Wa takbir, Allahu Akbar. Wa tahmeed. They say that Sayyidina Abdullah bin Umar, and Sayyidina Abu Huraira, during these days, they would go to the, to the marketplace in Medina and just say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And then the people in the marketplace would respond. Yeah? Maybe don't, I don't know, try it in Luton to see what happens. Yeah, nowadays, we have to reclaim Allahu Akbar. Because when people hear Allahu Akbar, there's a negative connotation now attached to it. Reclaim that. Yeah? But what's interesting, where, where did Sayyidina Abdullah bin Umar and Abu Huraira, where did I say they did this? In the marketplace, why whoever said that? Brothers, you, it's always them that answer. And it's shame, shame, I know some of your names. Yeah? Right? Why did the sisters remember that here we're mentioning what? Um, that they mention it in the marketplace. Why, the, why discern the marketplace? Why is that part of the hadith? Why not? Why didn't they come? You know, like we all clap for the NHS on our doorsteps. Yeah? Don't give them any money. But well, let's just clap for them. Yeah? La ilaha illallah. We could just come out of our doorsteps. La ilaha illallah. Allahu Akbar. Right? We could do tahmid, alhamdulillah. Why does Sayyidina Abdul Umar and Abu Huraira go to the marketplace and do it? Why, our dear sisters? It's a place where the Prophet said what? Yeah? Firstly, Abghad al bilad ilallah aswaquha. The most abhorrent of places to God are market shopping centers, right? Why? Because there are places, our dear sister, the place of ghafla, heedlessness. And your prophet tells, tells you what? Al-dhakir bayn al-ghafilin kil mujahid bayn al farin The one who is dhakir remembers Allah amongst those people who are heedless because in the marketplace we're thinking about dunya ordinarily. We're not thinking about Allah, right? That the one who remembers Allah amongst those who are heedless has the rank of the soldier who stands firm on the battlefield whilst everyone else flees. So look where they're making this in those blessed days. They're going to the marketplace, a place that is outwardly abhorrent to Allah becomes beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just by what? Just by making something emanate on the, from the tongue that, that starts where? From the heart. You have now transformed that reality. You know, I can say things about, you know, share stories about what happened in the, pris- in the prisons that the Fakhira had, had the blessings of doing service in. Places of, quote unquote, you know, universities of criminality transformed into what? Places of light by the Mawalid being mentioned in there, by the dhikr of Allah, by the Jummah being established there, by circles of knowledge, because the angels seek those places out. So outwardly places which we wouldn't necessarily give much time to become transformed merely by things which are mentioned by the tongue. And so these 10 days should be absolutely replete with dhikr. Turn off your phone. T- meaning, t- <laughs> for, you may, do, do a psalm, like have a fast from your phone. Have a fast from Netflix. Have a fast from BBC iPlayer. You, whatever, honestly, it'll do you good. You're going to find so much solace in your heart from now, you know, divorcing these things and then try to divorce them like you know, 
you know, three pronouncements so you can't go back to it. Uh, and let's see what happens. You'll be a better person for it. But, you know, this is what Allah diversifies and brings these days. Right? Your Prophet says to you what? That in your lives, and your lives are finite, and they're momentary in the wider scope of your existence, that in the days of your lives are nafahat. Like a nafha, literally, it's a breeze. And it's a breeze when things are um, hot. And you only feel that cool breeze. So nafahat, literally, it's a gift. But he, the Prophet is what? Nafahat min Allah. That there's nafahat min Allah. And the Prophet is telling you what? Alafa ta'arradu laha. Meaning, avail yourselves to the gift. Who's, who's giving the gift? Right? Who is giving the gift? We're going to see, you know, coming up shortly, things that we can do outside, even outside of these days, which is akin to the reward of Hajj or Umrah. Meaning every single day these things are, every single day your Lord wants to give you these gifts, but we don't avail ourselves to these gifts. I give the stupid example, if I was to give, you know, brothers and sisters, you know, a hundred pounds every day for attending a prayer, would you all attend? I know you do it for five pounds. Right? Well, your Lord is giving you an hajj and an umrah every day in multiple opportunities. We're so blessed. Honestly. You know, what, what, what's the, the, the commencing statement of scholars when, before they give a, give a talk? That at one level has nothing to do with what they're about to say. Alhamdulillah, ni'matil Islam wa kafa biha min ni'ma. All praise is for Allah, no doubt. For the blessings of Islam, wa biha min ni'ma, it just suffices as the supreme blessing. This is something which is unique to the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So, how many days are going to pass us by? How many months are going to pass us by? How many years are going to pass us by? And we're not availing ourselves to the gifts of Allah subhanahu wa taala, right? So, be in a state of dhikr, inshallah, during these days. You know, they, they say that the fuqara is a hadith that the, the, the poverty stricken, they came to the Prophet Sallallahu saying that the, the affluent, the people with wealth have got all of the reward, right? Why? Uh, um, they pray just as we pray. And they fast just like we fast. But they have an extra virtue over us they have wealth to what? Perform the Hajj and to perform the Umrah. And they have wealth to then provisions to go and wage the martial campaign and likewise to give charity. I mean, the people who are, who are poverty stricken, they can't do that. And so the Prophet he goes, Should I tell you something? If you were to cling to it, you have taken everything that they've been given. And he just said, What? Right? Just say, Subhanallah, Walhamdulillah, Wallahu Akbar, 33 times after every prayer. And you've got all of that Hajj and that Umrah. You've got all of that Sadaqah. Right? There's so many opportunities that we have in relation to what? Dhikr during this month and outside of, and outside of this month. So definitely fast. Definitely be in a state of Dhikr. And for those who can um, afford it, um, although I believe it's wajib, again, in the Hanafi school, for those who can afford it, is to make sure they do what the udhiyah, okay, the sacrifice. Because the hadith of um, the Prophet ﷺ counseling his beloved, you know, the one who said, Fatima tu bid'atun minni. That the one he said that, and this is the only person he's ever said this about in his life, that Fatima, radiallahu ta'ala anha, is literally part of me. Yaqbidni ma yaqbiduha, wa yabsutni ma yabsutuha. That which causes her displeasure causes me displeasure, and that which brings happiness to heart brings happiness to my heart. And so his counsel to his most beloved, someone who was part of him, was what? Ya Fatima, qumi ila udhiyatik, meaning stand and perform the udhiya. Fa inna laki bi awwal qatratin taqtaru min damiha yughfar lak ma salafa min dhunubika. Because when you um, commission or perform the slaughtering, before the first drop touches um, the ground, all of your quote-unquote sin is what? 
is effaced. And so she says, O Messenger of Allah, هذا لنا أهل البيت is this specific to your, your family خاصة أو لنا وللمسلمين أما or is it for us and for the entire corpus of, of the Muslim community بل لنا وللمسلمين أما مرتين and he said it twice to affirm or confirm this that you slaughter for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before the first drop touches the ground right you are forgiven all of your sins and in other narrations, yet you're giving a reward, a hasana for every single hair on the body of that animal. How many hairs would there be on that? We couldn't even guess, could we? Right? And so if we're able to, if we're financially able to do and it's wajib, then we should obviously do that. Something which is one of the greatest acts to do, Yom al-Nahar on the day of slaughter and then tashriq when that, um, when that meat is, uh, is distributed. Okay? Again, just to, as, as an aside, from the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the grace and generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in relation to what? Attending um, or getting, sorry, attaining the reward for the hajj and or the umrah. You know, there's many things that we have just throughout our days. So from amongst them, the Prophet said, Man al masjid, whoever frequents the mosque, la yuridu illa an yata'allama, going there to attend the circle of knowledge, to learn, khayran, to learn goodness, o yu'allimahu, or someone who's going to teach, he gets the reward of a complete hajj. Right? Again, mashallah, opportunity after opportunity. Right? Meaning, the 10 days will pass us by. But do these opportunities pass us by? The 10 days are going to go, they're going to come and go swiftly. Right? But do we take these opportunities when they're literally on our doorstep? Just as we take the opportunity to excel in the dunya. Or just as we take the opportunity to excel in secular study or the like, do we have um, dedicated time for these things and have shukr for those? To attend the circle of knowledge, you get the reward of what? The hajj. We know the hadith about um, the duha, salat al-duha, that if you pray fajr and you remain there up until salat al-duha, and again you get the reward of what? A hajj and an umrah. And then the Prophet says what? Tam, tam, tam. Completely. And he says it thrice to what? Accent this reality. You can't, maybe you can't do it every day. Maybe you can't, but you can do it once a month. Once a week. Once a year. Right? Dedicate that, okay, once a year, once a month, once I'm going to do something, I'm going to make sure that I tend Fajr in the masjid, and just stay there. Why do you think Islamic seminaries in the Muslim world, you attend the Fajr in Jama'ah, and then you have lessons immediately after you finished your daily litanies. And then your lessons go up until what? Ishraq, Duha, and then you pray. And you do that every single day apart from your, your, your well, you're still doing, they don't have lessons on the Friday, but they read, they read the Quran, they have a khatam of Quran. Meaning there's meanings behind why schedules are instituted as they're instituted. You can't do it every day, okay. Do it once. Once. You know, this is why at least have the intention to do it. We just gave the example of intentions before. At least have the intention to do it. Why does the Prophet say the intention of a believer surpasses the act in and of itself? Because the act, think about when you pray or if you intend to do something. Or when you go for your hajj, if you went for your hajj, you may endeavor to do well, you may have challenges, you may be preoccupied and the like. But if you just made the intention to do it and your Lord is giving the reward for that act, there's no deficiency in that act. Right? If you have the intention to give sadaqah, so you're about to give sadaqah, you think, well, I need some of it, or you know, there's something murky about the intention, right? But if the intention alone is there, and Allah gives the reward for that, the act is perfect. It's void of the deficiencies you may have. So at- intend to attend gatherings of knowledge, intend to pray duha. You know, Sayyidina Sa'id ibn Musayyib, Say- Sa- Sa'id ibn Musayyib, Musayyib, sorry, he said what? Lajum'atun ahabbu alayya min Friday, the day that we're in today, right? The day that we're on today, that to attend the Friday prayer is more beloved to me than a, um, a hajj that is not wajib. Meaning, if you've performed your hajj, now you've absolved yourself of that responsibility and you're to perform another hajj thereafter, a voluntary hajj, if you like, 
right? The, the Juma to attend the Juma, meaning again, one of the muhaddithun of our Ummah, right? Understands that even when the Juma, there's something akin to performing what? The Hajj. Every single day. But how do we perform Juma? You know, just fit it in to make sure that we get in there and get out. Well, alhamdulillah, no judgment per se. Right? But think about these states. Like I said, ihram is a sacred state. You enter prayer in a sacred state. You say, Allahu Akbar, they call it Allahu Akbar, takbiratul ihram or tahreem. You're entering into sacred space. You know, these things should be, they say that in the, in the, in, in the days of old, in the valley of Hadramaut, they say that people used to attend Jummah holding candles. Right? What, what do they mean by that? You get so much reward for being there, what, early? That they would pray Fajr, go home, and then come out again before the sun had even risen. So you're attending Jummah in where it's not even lit, the sky's not even lit up yet. Right? That's someone what, who's honoring Jummah, honoring prayer. I told you before that people I saw with my own eyes, people who are blind, that would come unaided just to pray in the masjid. Blind. Blind, unaided, literally touching you know, cars and houses to find their way to the masjid. Is, are they, in, in terms of Islamic fiqh, um, that the, um, the congregational prayer has to be established by a certain number of people. It's not even binding on people who are blind then, is it? People who have um, illnesses and the like. We would see men who had, um, uh, who reached an age where they had back issues where they couldn't even stand up straight. And then they're walking to the masjid, like just almost keeling over. They could have prayed at home, could they have not? These are people who honor prayer, honor sacred space. You know, and these are meanings. The, meaning, when Sayyidina Sa'id says what? That Jummah is more beloved to me than a voluntary hajj, right? We may not have a frame of reference for what that means. Why? Because we don't honor Jumu'ah. Right? That's why. But what does that mean? How can it be? We don't understand what Jumu'ah is. There's no exaltation of these things like those people exalted. Think about going to Juma in those days with candles. They're going there exceptionally early to be in a state of dhikr and remembrance. They're preparing themselves from very early in the morning for that prayer. They know that there's an hour that Allah will not refuse someone's supplication. You know, these, these aren't just asatir um, al-awwaleen, just narratives that again we pass by day in, day out. Day in, day out. No, these are people that, you know, you exalt God and His religion, He will exalt you. Sorry, honor. I don't like the word exalt. You honor Him and His religion, then you'll be honored. And you're honored through this. نَحْنُ قَوْمْ عَزْنَ اللَّهِ بِالْإِسْلَامِ فَمَحْمَا تَلَبْنَ الْعِزَّ بِغَيْرِهِ أَذَلَّنَ اللَّهِ Right? Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, said what? We are a people that derive our honor via Islam. Wherever we seek our honor outside of Islam, God will abase you. Muslims are abased. Like we, we are not a quote unquote feared people, uh, apart from, you know, from, a, from, a, from an unhealthy aspect. Right? As an ummah, right? Your, 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 again, your sphere of influence. Do they see you honoring your faith? Because we seek our honor outside of Islam. And what does Sayyidina Umar say? Well, then God's going to abase you. He's going to lower you. Right? So to perform the Friday prayer, to perform the Eid prayer, the companion to say going out to Eid al-Fitr is equal to performing an Umrah and going out to Eid al-Adha is equal to performing a Hajj, being in service to other people. Al-Hasan al-Basri. Who's Who's Al-Hasan al-Basri? Who is he? By difference of opinion, he said a Tabi'een. The more dominant position is it is Sayyidina Uwais al-Qarni, I, the best individual from the generation after the companions. So it's either on the dominant position, Uwais al-Qarni, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, or it's al-Hasan al-Basri. He says what? He says, Mashyaka fi hajati akhik al-Muslim khayrun laka min hajja ba'da hajja. Just to be in the service of a fellow Muslim is better than performing hajj after hajj after hajj in terms of reward. Okay, meanings. Meanings, we have opportunities in this community to be in the service of, of one another. Another example before we finish, we're finished, we're just talking about examples outside, i.e. to try and extend these meanings outside of the month of, of the Hijjah. That a man came to the Prophet ﷺ for wasa rajulan, that he counseled an individual, bi birri ummihi, to show piety unto his mother, 
فَقَالَ لَهُ أَنْتَ حَاجْ وَمُعْتَمِرْ وَمُجَاهِدْ That if you show piety unto your mother, you get the reward for being someone on Hajj and someone on Umrah and someone who is again in the martial struggle for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Opportunity after opportunity. We're so blessed. We're just so blessed. Right? The culmination of these days takes us when? Takes us to Yawm al-Arafah. Right? The Prophet said what? Al-Hajju Arafah. Okay, what does he mean in that, that, that phraseology? Like when the Prophet said, a deenun nasiha, religion is sincere counsel, meaning it's a, it's a rukun, an absolutely integral, essential part of, of religion. Hajj, of course, it's not just Arafah. You have the tawaf, you have the sa'i, you have the halq, you have the haram, ila akhirihi. But when the Prophet said, al hajju Arafah, i.e., the most integral part of the Hajj is Arafah. Right? And again, it's, the, it's, a, it's our day. And it's a beloved day to us more so, the greatest day in the entire Islamic calendar. But it's the harshest and the hardest day upon who? The devil in and of himself. Iblis. When the Prophet ﷺ, he goes, he goes, مَا رُؤِيَ الشَّيْطَانِ يَوْمًا هُوَ فِيهِ أَصْغَرْ وَأَدْحَرْ وَأَحْقَرْ وَأَغْيَذْ That the devil himself has never witnessed a day where he is more belittled and contemptible and vexed. That this is the day which um, vexes the devil, Iblis in and of himself, min yom al-Arafah, than the day of Arafah. Why? وَمَا ذَاكَ إِلَّا لِمَا يَرَى مِنْ تَنَزُلُ rahma. Why? Because Allah allows this contemptible being to see the dissension of mercy. Right? But for us, it's, it's happiness, isn't it? That he allows him to see the descending of mercy. وَتَجَاوَزَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَىٰ عَنْ ذُنُوبِ الْعِذَامِ And that he allows the devil to see what? Allah forgiving ذُنُوب sins al idham What does that mean? Major sins. Right? Major, those, those things which we're you know, deeply ashamed of. Or people have perpetrated things from what we call the kabair. You know, sins from one aspect. For the Salihin, all of the sins are what? Are major. But from one aspect, um, uh, sins are major and minor. Those major sins are the ones that Allah will efface. Yawm al-Qiyamah. Yawm uh, al-Qiyamah by virtue of what? The day of Arafah. You know, they say that Sayyidina um, uh, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, he comes to Sufyan al-Thawri, an great from our tradition, uh, on the day of Arafah. And Sufyan al is kneeling, and Sayyidina Abdul ibn Mubarak, he sits next to him. And Sufyan al he turns to Sayyidina Abdul ibn Mubarak, and he goes, in your opinion, who would be the worst people on the day of Arafah? And Sayyidina Abdul ibn Mubarak, he says, what? He goes, that the worst person on the day of Arafah, meaning someone who, who is on there, on the plane of Arafah, is someone who believes that he won't be forgiven. In our school, it's what's known as, again, what we just spoke about, what major and minor sins. It's a major sin that if you were to perform hajj to believe that you won't be forgiven. It's almost like forced optimism. You have to be optimistic about this one. You have to look forward to the, to the grace and fadl and forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, this is our day. This is our day. You know, they say that um, uh, Sayyidina Ali ibn Wafaq, one of the greats of our tradition, they say that he performed over 60 hajj. Uh, and he stands on the, the plain of Arafah and he's just gazing upon the throngs. And again, for those that have been there, you know, alhamdulillah, I had the blessings of going many years ago from Damascus uh, to perform the Hajj, and I'll accept it, inshallah, in those early days. And, you know, logic is, is it, it's, it's thrown out of the window. Why? It doesn't make sense that Allah can encompass so many people. You just see throngs and throngs of people. It logically, just does, you know, how does it encompass that space? is finite. Whether you're going from Arab, when you go from Arafat to Muzdalifah, I had to do it walking because, for anyway, it's, a, it's another story for another time. But we did the Hajj, um, you know, walking, and you're just seeing in front of you, as far as the eye can see, hundreds and thousands of people. You look behind you, hundreds and thousands of people. You rest, people are passing you by. Again, elderly people walking for those who can't afford those air-conditioned coaches or the like. And it's all good. This is no judgment. But just to see those people and you think, Allahu Akbar, look at these people. 
the love that they have, that they're walking seven miles, you know, you know, old couples holding hands, all hoping for the gaze and nazar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Ali ibn Muwafiq, he's just gazing Yawm al-Arafah upon those people and he has like an occurrence to his heart and he says, oh Allah, if any of those people, Hajj isn't accepted, because I've done 60, I, I, I donate one of mine to them. Concern for the Ummah, uh, and so they say that Ali ibn Muwafiq, he sees, um, he has a dream uh, and he sees his Lord addressing him, saying what? Ya ibn Muwafiq, are you trying to be more generous than me? Right? Are you trying La ilaha illallah? Are you trying to be more generous than myself? I've forgiven those on the plane of Arafah, wa man and those who resemble them. Not just those people on who are there on the plane of Arafah, wa man and those who resemble those people on the plane of Arafah, and I've allowed Shafa intercession for each of them and their family and their children and their relatives. You're not more generous than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, one of the, 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 the practices of, in the Valley of Hadramaut is that on the day of Arafah in Yemen, they call it Yom Ta'rif, meaning, you know, why is Arafah from an opinion called Arafah? Because it's a day yet Arafah Allah alibadihi, that Allah comes to acquaint himself. No, Arafah is to know. His, his, um, his servants. Wallahu alam, Allah knows his servants, but more so, more intimately. And so ta'rif here, they call it the day of ta'rif, I to get to reacquaint yourself with Allah. And they will go to an area outside um, amongst um, the mountains, and it will just be like from Asr till Maghrib, just dhikr and salawat upon the Prophet. And they will read specific prayers um, dedicated for this day. And then the, the elders will give like reminders about what should we be doing uh, on this day and on the day of Eid and on the days of, of Tashriq. And then those who are fasting break their fast with something simple and they pray Maghrib together out, right? Well, who are they trying to resemble? Why go outside to this plane? Because they're trying to resemble those people. And here, look, we spoke about those two hadith. Are those things specific or dedicated for who? Just the people on Hajj? No. This is for everyone, right? Is the, the, the fadl of Allah restricted to the people on the plain of Arafah? No. Even in terms of thinking about the time difference. That if we're, we're saying it's dedicated to the people who are standing on the plain of Arafah, well, in Australia, that day's already gone. In New York, hasn't even begun. But it's still the ninth for them, isn't it? It's still the ninth of the Hijjah. It's not restricted. We can't restrict the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, they, they, they mention a story of one of the Salihin who, um, uh, no, sorry, the, not one of the, the Salihin mentioned the story of a man. And all they say in the hadith, I, in, in, the, in the tradition, that I don't know whether he performed um, Hajj or Umrah, but he's just on the plain of Arafah. So they don't mention that he's actually performed the Hajj or the, or the Umrah. And so he just takes some stones. And he says to the stones, he goes, I make you bear witness that I'm a person of la ilaha illallah. Right? And they say that he sees himself in a dream standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he's standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is taken to account for his sins. And he said to him, he goes, take this individual to the fire. And so he goes, that when I'm en route to one of the, the gates of, of hellfire, I see these big rocks that are in front of the gates of hellfire. And I recognize them to be the stones that I made bear witness that I'm a person of la ilaha illallah. That they barred me now from what? Entering into hellfire. So the stones, the seven stones, blocked the seven gateways to hellfire. And then when he said the la ilaha illallah, the manifestation of the testament just takes him to what? To paradise. So just that space or being connected to that space. Right? La ilaha illallah. And then the last point again to show the same individual, the individual who performed 60 um, hajjis, Ali ibn Wafaq, he goes that um, I see on the eve of the day of Arafah, I see two angels having a conversation. And in their conversation, they descended from the seven heavens and one says to the other, he goes, how many people perform the hajj this year? And so the angel says 600,000 people performed Hajj in whatever year this was. 
And so he goes, he goes, do you know of how many of those people, the angel asked one, the other angel, how many hajjis were accepted from the 600,000? And so the other angel goes, he goes, I have knowledge that six people's hajj was accepted. Out of how many? 600,000. And so Ali ibn Wafaq, he wakes up and he's just disturbed. Again, concerned for what people? Concerned for their hajj, concerned for their umrah, concerned for their acceptance. And he said that the day I was just disturbed, that whole day, thinking about what I saw in that dream. And so he goes back to sleep and he sees another dream again, same two angels, they descend from the heavens. And he says, he goes, do you know what the judgment was in relation to the people of hajj? And he says that um, he says that Allah accepted for each person whose Hajj was accepted, He accepted a hundred thousand other people, meaning all of those people's Hajj was accepted by what the Hajj of six individuals. We have so many examples of hope, so many examples of forgiveness, so many examples of acceptance, so many examples of realizing that we are just, you know, tainted. Soiled, disturbed souls. And we look to the, again the barakah of gatherings like this, the barakah of the intention of people that came here today. Like I said, you do not have to be here. You choose to be here. Now, with Allah, that means something. And it means something every single week that we've been together. And all, not here, all of the lessons that you've been attending with your other teachers, the Monday gatherings, the other, the archery lessons, all of the school, the, the madrasas, the school, the school children's madrasa and the like, all of these things have a reality. But more so what? When we come to honor days that are honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we ask that by honoring those days of Allah, and by honoring them by virtue of the barakah of the gathering, Allah accepts us, inshallah, accepts all the intentions that we make. And Allah places in our hearts intentions that we haven't thought of. And um, Allah places in our hearts meanings to associate ourselves to the people who are connected to the people of Hajj, inshallah. May Allah accept it, accept your intentions, accept those who are going there. And allow us to be from the hadith man tashabbaha bi qawmin fuhu minhum, whoever resembles the people is of them. And we pray that, inshallah, that the 10 days that are coming, we do endeavor. We do endeavor that it's more than just reading. It's more than just making notes. It has to mean something, inshallah.